I think a, a great salesperson will build a relationship and help attach to that person It's career. So I think building the relationship with your economic buyer and then differentiating between the decision maker and buyer and helping those persons get to the next stage of where they're at. You mutually agree to what success looks like with the customer and you understand what their outcomes are, their before scenario, their after scenario, what this means. Why is this project so critical? So really defining out the compelling event, but it's not the compelling event piece. It's more working with that champion and them becoming a lifelong friend, buyer. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Masters of Medic. I'm here with Jeff Miller. Welcome, Jeff. Why don't you introduce yourself and let us know how you got into this wonderful world of sales? Hey, Andy, thank you for having me. Um, again, the name is Jeff Miller. Uh, I'm happy to be on the... I got into sales a little over 30 years ago uh, when I graduated college, knew that um, the real opportunity to make money was taking advantage of the assets that you had and... Uh, for me, it was an outgoing personality and being good with people. Uh, I looked at consulting opportunities. I looked at when I graduated school, I looked at uh, some computer science Did I want to get into engineering side of the house and programming side of the house. And, and I just did not enjoy that enough. And I knew that dealing and working with people and helping people achieve their goals was something that I always wanted to do. So I, uh, I went into sales and the first job uh, I, I did, I think, uh, taught me invaluable lessons about rejection, which many of us face our entire lives. Uh, and I was a door to door salesman selling uh, long distance where I literally was handed here is your zip code and here is a, a map of all the office parks. And I would literally go door to door selling long distance. What, what were you selling? It was uh, back at the time, it was for a, co a company called LDS, which was then merged with LDDS Metromedia, which was then merged with MCI. And then that's when a lot of consolidation and then a lot of bad things were happening in uh, telecommunications. But in essence, right. I would literally go to the medic office and say, hey, Andy, let me see your phone bill. I think I can save you some money. And we're talking like tenths of a cent and go in. You know, you get a thousand dollar, you go land a thousand dollar a month customer. And that was an elephant back in the day. Right. And, but you can make a lot of money doing it. And uh, it, you're suiting up every day and you're, you're, you're literally going to door to door in office parks, trying not to get thrown out of buildings. You're looking at the signs that say no solicitations. Um, so I have a special spot in my heart for the I can't tell you how many times I would see people dragging like these copy machines and and big things that they had to sell from going door to door. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of mutual respect and uh, a lot of smiles and a lot of thankfulness that I wasn't selling copiers. Yeah, I have this theory around that type of sales because you tend to be doing you learn so much and you tend to be doing lots of sales cycles. They're sort of micro sales cycles. But you get the kind of the full cycle. And I have this theory about a lot of what sales is, is like pattern recognition. You know, you get to a situation and it's an objection and you know you've been in that situation 10 times before and there's 10 possibilities or there's five possibilities. And you know, you know the more you meet that, that moment, the more experience you get at overcoming it or finding out what happens if you take the wrong path. And so I have this real like love for that type of sales and people that come from that type of sales because you get an accelerated learning experience over the full cycle and getting to read, you know, how many times, you know, you get to ask for the order instead of once a week, like a typical AE probably does, you get to ask for the order five times a day and you get to yeah. sort of, you know, accelerated learning. So I think, I think it's such, and I don't know about you, but I had a real challenge going from that type of sales into, you know, more sort of what we would class as sort of higher class sales or more professional sales. How did you make the jump from that into whatever you did next? Yeah, that's a great question and, and great observations. I think one of the things you learn most is, you know, on the door to door, you're very, very transactional. So you got to really think on your feet a lot. And most of the time, objective number one is getting past that first gatekeeper, which you, know, you have to do in top down enterprise selling uh, anyways, but you're learning the hard way because you're facing the gatekeeper and you've got to come with something of value 
and see what's going on with them to get to that next step or you just get immediately blocked and you're on to the to the next office right right next door yeah. and i think it's a uh, the valuable lessons there are you get you really got to understand situational awareness and a lot of these people secretaries office managers they have bad days too and right. um coming in too hot or too cheesy or not having <laughs> any value is really a difficult thing and i think it teaches you as in a time i just had graduated uh clemson university and was literally um two weeks after graduation when i started so i was very green i didn't know anything other than you know, I had to do a lot of door-to-door -door selling when I was in high school. I sold uh, water purifiers, you know, growing up and my parents were, the best thing they taught me was if you're going to go play these sports, I played sports my whole life. I was very fortunate to play in college and stuff, but you had to fund all your travel and they did all these, you know, you'd go door-to-door. -door. We sold candy bars a lot and I always did exceptionally well with that, but it, it, my parents, it was because my parents forced me to do it. They, they weren't, I think nowadays, if you go look on people's Facebooks to, you know, I have four daughters. You know, when they did cheering or whatever, you just simply would post it or you would, now I made my daughters go door to door to sell it. Cause that's wow. what I grew up with. But I, I see that. a lot of their friends where the parents would just say, Hey, buy, they're selling sheets, they're selling whatever. And it's a whole different world. And I think you don't get that human to human interaction, which is something that you have to have if you're going to get good. It's, it, you have to be able to read people. You have to understand situational awareness of, of what's going on around you. And then you have to come with enough charisma or value to really get them to get to the next stage. And that was great. I think now you know, I, I did that for a year and then I transitioned into the software world. And I will say the hardest lesson I had from there is um, how do I slow down my asking for the sale so much and right. really making sure I'm driving the right process, right? And back in those days, there wasn't medic, right? So yeah. most people had their own version of what a sales process was. The first ever meeting I went on, I, I can still remember it now, as I missed it on a toy and I was selling ERP software and I've closed it on the day because that's what I did. That's what you had to do. If you didn't close it on the day and B2B C sales, you're it was out. So I ring my boss and I was like, yeah, great. I'm here and I'm sort of in the corridor going, yeah. Um, so can you like email me the contract or something? And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, I've, I've closed, like we're done. And she's like, no, 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 no. You need to come back to the office and then we have to create a proposal and then we'll send it to him. And then if he wants to go ahead, then you can. And I remember I was like, that, that seems bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. <laughs> but I did it. And then, you know, long story short, we eventually, it took like another few weeks. Right. And I, um, and this was sort of before DocuSign was really sort of taking off. So I drove back and it was quite a long way. And because I wasn't, um, I wasn't an AE. I didn't have a company car. So they had to rent me a car every time. So I get there. I get there a bit early. I'm about sort of 45 minutes early. I'm sat in the car waiting for my meeting. And I see him come out and he's putting stuff in his car. And I sort of think, oh, no, he's going home. So I get out and I go over to him and he's, I say, you know what? I'm here. And he goes, oh, yeah, I forgot. And, and we actually signed the contract on his spoiler of his car. And I was thinking, this is <laughs> madness. This is like three or four weeks later than I could have done it. But so yeah, I, it made me laugh when you said- That Captain sounds like the shortest ERP down. sales cycle I've, I've ever heard. That's amazing. <laughs> it was. <laughs> and oh my, I didn't know what I was, I mean, I still don't know what I'd be doing selling ERP, but even less so then. And I just, I just remember there's a few cool things that the software did that resonated with me that I just pitched and he must've just had sympathy or something. Yeah, I learned a long time ago from Rob, the number one asset that every seller has is time, okay? And it's not where to spend time, it's really the focus on where not to spend time, right? Nice. So you got to eliminate by asking all the right questions ahead of time, right? And I took uh, Horton Works over a quarter of a billion from scratch to a quarter of a billion in revenue uh, as a publicly traded company. And you don't get there unless you can implement process at scale and you understand ASPs and, and, and you know, how do I shrink and condense a seal cycle to get rep efficiency, all the things that VCs completely yeah. measure on. Those are the things that you have to get really, really good in the most hostile of environments because you're public, you don't hit a number, the stock creators, technical founders, they don't understand it. No. They, no. they, they don't understand go to market. They do not, they understand how to build great tech. And some technical founders do not have an appreciation for what we do because they think the product just sells themselves. And when you do tell them that their baby is ugly, it's very <laughs> hard for them to hear. 
And, yeah. um, and I think that's where open source allows you to kind of constantly innovate and take the customer feedback. And if you're not listening to your customers, if that customer is not first with your mentality, then your product is most likely going to fail. Yeah, for sure. I'll take you back. What you said is really interesting about that idea of, you know, the, the user um, using your product in a product led growth motion um, and having that bad experience. And I think, I think that's one of the things that we've seen where Medic can really help because like the way that we see Medic is a little bit different from, I think the, the more broader market we, we see, it starts for us as a common language. And so I think most people sort of just still keep Medic in this qualification framework box, which of course it's, you know, world-class at, it's the best at. We see it as this common language and what that enables you to do if you take that that mindset with it is it's it's a common language that can do anything it can be a methodology it can be qualification frame it can be the way in which you measure the impact of a product it can be the way you measure the impact of a division of a, a region or something like that compared to the else because you all of a sudden you're going to be able to see where are we strong in certain elements where are we weak all that kind of good stuff but from one of my favorite um, ways that helps is as a go-to-market common language because now we have a language that transfers across from marketing to SDRs, the channel to SEs to talk about anything relating to value stakeholders and process. We've got the, we've got the words, we've got the language. And so if I'm, a, if I'm an organization with a product-led growth motion or an open source motion for that matter, I know, just as you said, like, you know, to a degree, our, we're away, you know, we're almost sort of behind one of those sort of mirrored glass things we can uh, they we know we know they're there but they don't know we're there right and they're kind of finding their way around and what we want to what we want to be able to do is kind of signpost them to you know this is how we can help this is the, what the value we can bring and i think the, the the way to do that is by making sure that we really resonate with the pain that the solution is, is solving because as we know so so often our customers don't actually know about the full breadth of the pain that they're facing, right? There's quite often a situation where they think, you know, or they, they or they, they're unaware or they think they don't know that it can be solved. So having that, that marketing motion that can inform, you know, if you're this type of customer and you're, you know, using our solution, you, you, it, did you know we can help you solve this? And did you know that these organizations have seen this value from solving it? And this is how we do it, which is the really important point, which is the decision criteria for us. We think that, we, we, we like very, very boldly think that the majority of customers have a really, really bad idea of what their decision criteria should be for anything because they're not experts in buying it. They're experts in doing whatever their day job is. And so we think if you inject Medic into motions like product like growth and open source, it gives you the framework to say, okay, well, this is, let's make sure this customer truly understands how we solve pain. Let's make sure the customer truly understands um, this is the value they get from solving it. Make sure they truly understand your point earlier about differentiators. This is how we do it. And this is why we're the only, we're the only show in town that can do this. And that's the marketing angle. That's the value angle covered. And then you've got the stakeholders, which is where the sales team can engage. Cause you can say, okay, that person is just an analyst. They are just a, you know, an engineer or something like that. They're not the person we're going to sell to, but knowing that they're using the solution the way they are, we now know we can go and find what we know is the typical persona profile as a champion. And so we can go and the sales team can kind of, use the P PQL in a manner that actually is informing them of who's using what and where, and then go and find stakeholders. And of course the process starts for us, not when the, you know, when a formal process starts, the process starts for us the second that customer engages, and then you can use MedPick and the decision process to go from how, you know, the decision process is not, should we buy this? The decision process starts with, should we even look at this? Should we even open this website? Should we even open this email and like taking them all the way through there? So. I do think, um, you know, like I said, it is a go to market motion, but I do think that it's um, like anything. There's just that baton, baton being passed from the marketing motion to the sales motion. And the more we use that common language, the more effective it can be. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's, it's a, I think you're spot on. It's a common language that you're very verbal ready across organizations to be consistent with what you message. And that's so, so important. It's, it is, you know, commanding, it's a command of that message, right? It's a, it's the marketing person delivering exactly what the salesperson is going to say, but also with content, but it's also the product managers who are going to say the same thing. Yeah. So many times in companies, you know, getting from zero to 10 million, you can kind of do 
pretty easily if you understand startup sales motion things of that nature going from 10 to 25 is a lot harder 25 to 50 is brutal 50 to 100 very brutal 100 plus totally different brutal brutality but i think if you have the right like sequence between everybody and everybody really can message this is our value prop this is where we're together this is where we can win and everybody's consistent it helps with the education of the market and that awareness that then gets you to help you get through some of these other inflection points because obviously companies innovate and as you innovate you want to make sure you do a release it's got to be educated to the masses. You got to have the right enable and you have the right steps and all that. And that's the same thing with going through every one of those stages of medic. It's, I don't know how you do and close deals unless you document every, you know, each, each of these steps there's, you can still close deals. You could get dumb luck, right? Um, you could be right place, right time. Um, but if you're having the manufacture to what we were just talking about previously is how do we create a compelling event? And, you know, one of the hardest things I found in software is, what are the metrics that you're measuring against? Like, how do you do it when everybody's deploying on different hardware and they need different query time or whatever the case may be that your product provides? How do you get clear, mutually agreed upon metrics that are measurable? And then how do you benchmark against those things so it's not skewed? It's very hard, right? And so if yeah. you don't document across the entire process, yeah. it leaves you exposed. Yeah, I agree. And I, yeah, and I think the challenge there is it's not just, it's not just that those metrics are hard to get. It's often that there's two reasons why it's hard to get a, the customers don't know their side of the metrics. So you can't apply, you know, the uplift that you, you know, that your solution can bring, um, or they don't want to share it with you, you know? And so it comes back to this kind of, we call it like the discovery paradox where sales teams have been told that they're supposed to go in and do discovery and, how they've been told to do that is by the LinkedIn gurus who've given them 10 silver bullet questions that apparently if you just read them out, you're just going to get right into whatever it is. Right. Um, right. and we know that doesn't work because customers don't like being interrogated because then that's what it feels like. And so you're left in this sort of paradox where you, what the customer wants is they want to know about the solution, but your solution is broad. You, you know, you, you, you're not going to do anybody any favors just by pitching, but that's kind of the choice you've got pitch or do discovery. We think there's a better way and it actually comes back to what you're saying about metrics and it's about using uh, what we would call an m1 which is uh, the, the the success stories you've had from your existing customers so are i going into a first meeting with whatever the profile of company is size location industry you know from whatever context i have from the outside in i'm going to look at my existing customer base and find the success stories i've had of where i've said hey i've, I've seen this before and let me tell you, we can help you solve it and tell the story of that because it doesn't, it means I don't go in and, you know, ask the customer what's keeping them awake at night and who else cares about this and all that nonsense. It means I can go in and I show that I'm prepared. I show that I'm relevant. I, well, I'm doing all of this while storytelling. I'm doing all of this while reference selling. And I'm talking to the customer about problems that they even know they had or they don't know they had or they didn't know they could be solved and how, not just that, but how we help solve them. And so what we find from that is those customers that wouldn't normally have those metrics where you're saying, you know, well, company X, which we think is like you, they were seeing that they were losing 20% of X from this pain. They go, actually, yeah, no, we're probably about the same. Or they're going, oh, we weren't quite that much. Or we're actually, we're much worse. And it's because you've given that little, little ounce of context, they can then go benchmark themselves and go, actually, no, that is, I see where you're coming from. And it, it's like one of those things where it just sort of the, famili the familiarity of it but also the, um, it's, I think it's the credibility that comes when you're coming in and you're looking prepared and they see that you've done it before. It just, I think it's such a game changer. Uh, so we, we, we really, you know, we really do a lot with metrics to tr really try and help broaden out how it gets used and, and therefore have it having more success with it. I think a, a great salesperson will build a relationship and help attach to that person it's career. So I think building the relationship with your economic buyer and then differentiating between the decision maker and buyer and helping those persons get to the next stage of where they're at. Um, that's where I get the most joy. It's I definitely don't get a lot of joy of trying to figure out what are the metrics, because yeah. a lot of that is 
really raw defined calculations, understanding the server size and what exactly, okay, the success criteria is based on this. Let's make sure it's fair and stuff. But you can get a lot of enjoyment when you mutually agree to what success looks like with a customer and you understand what their outcomes are, their before scenario, their after scenario, what this means. Why is this project so critical? So really defining out the compelling event, but it's not the compelling event piece. It's more working with that champion and them becoming a lifelong friend buyer. I cannot tell you how many customers I've worked with for the last 20 plus years of open source. I think if you handle yourself with tremendous integrity and you always put the customer first and not your own, I want to make money first or I want to sell my product, whatever it is, you're going to have a very good outcome. And the most joy I've had is building that champion and seeing them deploy your solution, be successful, and they go from being a developer one day because, you know, they download the product to a director, to a VP, to next thing you know, it's they're the CIO and yeah. they'll pick up your, your phone, you know, your call every time on their cell phone because you've done multiple. I mean, I, I have a lot of buyers I've worked with for four different companies, five different companies. And I think it's a testament to actually truly caring about how do you make them successful? Right. And so mm -hmm. it does tie everything in medic back to that. Right. I mean, it's like every, every one is equally important, but building that champion and then having them forever, that's where I get the most joy. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I, I went to a, um, a wedding of a champion of mine's last year, uh, which I think is really fun. Uh, who's awesome. a really close friend of mine now as well, but it was, it was, you know, someone that, uh, someone that actually the funniest thing we laugh about this now, but the funniest thing about that person was they were, head of e-commerce at one of the, you know, one of the far, like fastest growing most, you know, I used to sort of joke that he was probably the most in demand person by SDRs in the world at one point, because he was like, the company was growing like that. And it was that time when marketing technology was really taking off. Um, and I, had, I had sort of for years tried to actually just get a meeting with him. And now he's like one of my best friends. It's kind of funny to, to have yeah. that, that sort of thing to fall back on. But yeah, it, I completely it, it, it's uh, one cool example similar to that, that where I kind of like as a full circle moment, I had a customer sold to it, a couple of companies did a very, very large transaction, built a tremendous relationship, you know, over the years and actually brought that person in to be a field CTO for us. Mm -hmm. And then seeing them blossom and, 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 and be super successful in a different capacity and then staying close, they won't stay a field CTO forever. They're going to go back to, you know, running engineering at a company, but getting them, it, it was really cool because now they get to see the dark side and what we have to go through and right and, and, and talking to like-minded people like themselves and they learning how to, you know, communicate it and then just learning so much from them on how they think and process. Right. A salesperson, if you're type A and you're meat eating and you just, you know, you're you're wind me up and roll. Sometimes you, you, you forget about little things and you can learn so much from how they process differently, because I read this book um, a while ago for those who have ADHD. It's a it's a great book called Faster Than Normal. And I have ADHD and I was trying to explain to my wife why. I have the inability for every year for Lent, I'll give up sweets. And then every year she'll give me a huge Easter basket and of sweets. And I won't just eat one of those sweets. I'll eat the higher, the entire basket in one sitting. And I'm talking boxes of Cadbury eggs, boxes of peanut butter eggs, jelly beans. It's because we don't understand the concept of moderation and our brains are wired way differently. And as you go through and learn you, you got to give yourself those dopamine hits to keep you at that level that you need so that you can focus very well on how do I do it? So I read that book so I could explain to my wife, this is how my brain works. You need to understand that when you look at me and be like, why is that guy going to work out three times a day? Or why is he doing something stupid that a normal person wouldn't consider doing? It's just how we're wired differently. And I think when you, when you understand your customers and how they think, Right. And you have to marry your thinking to theirs because it doesn't really matter what you want to achieve. It's how do you make them successful? That's the only way this is going to get get done. I think that's when you really, truly kind of mature as a as a seller and will look at the full picture and then really get the understanding of, OK, 
all pieces of this medic process, they've got to be able to, the, the methodology has to be followed to get them through my process. Yeah. And I, I'm going to ask you something. I have this theory that um, people with ADHD have a bit of a superpower for sales. There's obviously downsides, <laughs> well documented, yeah. but the, because the way I describe it is that when a customer is talking to you and you're, you're, in, a, you're in a sales conversation with the customer, and you're learning, and you're curious, and you're understanding. The way that I think normal people's brains works is like, um, is that it just follows the path, and it's going like this. It's it's carrying on. Well, camera there. It's going like this. It's following a path, a linear path of questions. The the, the curiosity that sparks in a person with ADHD's brain is they go, well, "What about this? Oh, that's like this. Oh, have you thought about that?" And all of a sudden, you've got these plethora of options that expand on the conversation and expand and, you know, and you're thinking, oh, that what that customer's just described there is just like this use case that I had over here. And what was interesting, and all of a sudden, I think it just makes a much more, um, for the customer, I think you, 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 you're digging deeper and you're surfacing a more, um, I don't know, like a deeper, a more uh, value orientated conversation. They're going to learn more from you because of, of all your information rather than just following that linear path. So I do, I do think it is a bit of a superpower. Yeah, no, I totally agree. You have to, you have to learn how to manage it, right? Then not everybody can manage <laughs> it, but once you, once you do, then yeah, it's absolutely a superpower. It's the same with, uh, you've probably read this too, people who conquer dyslexia and have ADHD. They're some of the most successful people on the planet. So yeah. many billionaires have it because yeah. they figured out how to harness it and they understand it and they can, they can do the work of two or three people because of it. Super, super interesting. Okay. So we are, I have one last question for you and it's a little bit like the question I asked earlier and it, it, it might inspire the same answer, but for different reasons, which is what do you think is the most important element of MedPick, which is the one that like, if a deal if you're looking at, you're reviewing a deal that you, you know, you're, you're in a deal review or something like that. And if there's, if it's not looking good the one you're like, this is, this is game over. Yeah. You know, that's, it, it really ties to, I think it's picking one. If I guess it ties to what's the accomplishment, what you're trying to accomplish. If it's getting a deal done on a time frame, then for me, it's really understanding the decision process and, and the paper process around it to make sure it can get done. There's so many times where you've technically, at least in open source, the technology has been used. So you know, it's a fit, you know, that you have the technical win. Um, if you can't tie to a process that ultimately gets it through, like you said, it's very difficult selling to banks. They got compliance, they have security. If you're selling a cloud product, it may take nine months to get through, you know, their security VPA and you, have to build time in for all those things and educate the masses. And a lot of time these buyers, maybe it's a developer who's got promoted to a director for the first time. And it's the first time going through this entire buyer process. I can't tell you how many times I've been going through our close plan reviews and, you know, uh, with the reps. And when you review that close plan and you start really dynamo, is this person ever, you know, successfully purchased software before and explain me the process and what was the sign? how many times they miss that little step. So I think uh, the most important at the stage, all things being even, let's just table stakes. They're either doing PLG or they're doing open source, but they're familiar with the product. The most important thing is really understanding the process to close and making sure it's tested at every, every gate. I, I'm a big believer in, you've got to get your customers to really agree to a mutual reverse timeline and sequence of events that you document because then you have the documentation that, you know, Lord knows if your CEO says why did that deal slip? Well, you know what? We have everything documented. This is exactly, you can see this is what they agreed to. As long as you document your process, you know, you should be good. So I, I would say that's probably the most important in, in my eyes based on what we sell. Yeah. I like that. And I also think there's a, you know, in your seniority as CRO, there is a part that, your involvement in opportunities, the decision process is going to be more important because typically the majority of opportunities you can see are more mature by the time they hit your desk. Um, whereas like some of the other elements are more important earlier in the process for sure, I think. But uh, yeah, I think it's a great way of answering the question. Really, I loved how you sort of said, you know, it depends on the circumstances, it's a great way of answering it. And it just shows the versatility and, you know, universality of 
of, of medics, which is really cool. So yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. This has been an incredible conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Um, if people want to connect with you, if you want, you know, if people like the sound of what you're talking about, maybe you have some open roles or something like that, where should people find you? Yeah, just hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very, very active on LinkedIn uh, and happy to talk to anybody and help anybody. I know this is when I went on my journey, if I hadn't met uh, the mentors that I've had in my career, the, it's very tough. There's a lot of information. I didn't have access to all this information that's out there now. You've got to really kind of, I wish everybody could get a Dakota ring on which are the ones you should do because everybody has a different position. I'm happy to, listen, I'm a serial startup person. So if people have questions or concerns, just hit me up through LinkedIn. I'll, I'll definitely uh, re re reply and help any way I can. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thanks for having me, Andy. It's great talk.